Today we're going to continue our discussion of time period seven, and we will actually be getting into the New Deal. Where we left off before was the Great Depression and the stock market crash and all of the factors that led into that economic crisis. And what we'll be looking at today are the various attempts to resolve those issues, those economic issues. So let's go ahead and get started. Chapter 22 is looking at, uh, again, this time period, 1929, which would be the stock market crash up through 1938, which would be the um, end of the New Deal and then starting to get into aspects related to World War II. So as we are looking at this, what we also need to keep in mind is a shift in the approach to government involvement in not just economic regulation, um, but also in, in um, social programs and social freedoms. So this changes the approach that we've seen before, what we call classical liberalism, which was prominent in the 1800s where we really didn't have a lot of, of strong government regulation or creation of policy there. We know that that changes a little bit with progressive reform, but where we see it definitely pick up is here at the turn of the century when the progressives become very entrenched and certainly here in our discussion of the New Deal. So this is a more modern liberalism. We've changed the definition to where um, the government takes a much larger role in regulating business and also legislating social freedoms at the same time. So we can kind of look at that with this graph or this, um, this representation going from the least amount of government regulation and involvement, which would certainly be anarchism, and then progressively moving forward towards the opposite end of that, per, that um, perspective, which would be socialism. So you can kind of see where we are, are switching here from classical liberalism in the 1800s to we move here to modern liberalism with the progressive reforms and the New Deal of the first half of the 20th century in the 1900s. So let's look at the early responses to the Great Depression. So who was president when the Great Depression first started um, and that stock market crashes? That was Herbert Hoover. And we see that by 1932, the conditions are really bad, right? We talked about the bank failures before. We talked about businesses going out of business. And we talked about um, unemployment on the rise. And so these were, were staggering um, statistics that would need to be overcome in some way. This was not a unique feature to the United States. The rest of the world, especially in Europe, was also experiencing economic uh, collapses and, and depressions of their own. And if you think about coming out of World War I, the United States would have been more positioned to, or better positioned to handle this type of a situation than Europe that was repairing itself after World War I. Um, part of this, we also will remember that um, farmers are also going to be struggling actually before the rest of the country is beginning to experience this. And this was something that was ignored. So if we look at the changes in, in prices that crops would be able to bring during the time period, you can see why farmers were struggling. They're bringing in a fraction of what they were bringing in before, but yet the payments that they have on their mortgages and on um, you know, debts that they owe, that wasn't changing. So they have less money available to them and that causes the farmers to be in deep trouble. Uh, in many respects, it was actually more expensive to harvest their crops, to buy the fuel for the, the farm equipment and to transport it to the market than they could actually get for their crops. So they were better off not even harvesting some of their crops, which again is going to add to some of the problems that we will see. Also, internationally, we need to remember that part of the Treaty of Versailles was that expectation of war reparations where Germany, that war guilt clause was established and they were expected to pay those reparations to the allied powers. None of that was happening. So to kind of jumpstart the economy, um, one of the, the areas where, where the United States is, is working towards trying to, to repair the, the problems in Europe was with what we call the Dawes Plan. So this is different than the Dawes Severalty Plan that we looked at with 
um, Indian lands out in the Western part of the United States. This is relating specifically to war reparations. So the United States is going to watch what happens. We are going to loan two and a half billion dollars to Germany, which allows them to rebuild begin to manufacture, employ people, begin to, to make money to allow them to pay what they owe to France and Great Britain, which allows them to pay back what they owe to the United States. It seems like a convoluted plan. And honestly, it doesn't work out in the way that the United States would expect because on the heels of this is when we will see the economic collapse worldwide. And so none of these payments are, are moving forward. So Hoover's response when the, um, Great Depression first begins. His response really is to allow the markets to correct themselves. He's looked back over time. He knows that in a capitalist system, you're going to have those natural highs and lows. We've talked about that before with the boom and the bust cycle. So he's not going to waver. He's not going to um, back off of the gold standard, which would put more money out in circulation, helping those farmers and those um, people who are heavily in debt. That's not what he's going to do. He's also going to believe in something called rugged individualism, where he believes that individuals should be responsible for their own livelihood. The government shouldn't come in and rescue people who are unemployed. Um, he also believes in charity organizations providing assistance. Sure, there are people who are unemployed. Sure, there are people who are losing their homes, but it shouldn't be the government's responsibility to resolve those issues that you could rely on private charities. That kind of gets back into that idea of the captains of industry where they're reinvesting their wealth into the community. So he also is, is looking at local communities to be able to, to monitor and care for their own people who were struggling. The problem was those local communities didn't have any cash to do it. He also is going to maintain a higher tariff to protect those businesses that were, str were struggling. The problem is there's retaliation for that. Other European countries began to put a tariff on American-made products, which means that we're not exporting anything. And so the economy just continues to get worse and worse. And Hoover refuses to, to make adjustments to that. Look at this quote from Hoover. Economic depression cannot be cured by legislative action. The government shouldn't be taking the actions. Um, economic wounds must be healed by the action of the cells of the economic body, the producers and the consumers themselves. So the businesses, the people, they need to be able to recover on their own. Okay. Where he first uses this phrase, rugged individualism, look what he has to say here. We were challenged with the choice between the American system of rugged individualism and a European philosophy of diametrically opposed doctrines, doctrines that are paternalistic and static socialism. So he's really kind of playing into this idea of the Red Scare at the time, this, this fear that communism and socialism would infiltrate the United States. And he worries that if, if the government gets involved in regulating these businesses and addressing the economic issues, then we're leaning more down that road towards socialism. All right, by 1931, things are in dire conditions and Hoover does attempt the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. This is one attempt that we can attribute to Hoover in trying to correct the economy. And it's going to provide government money to railroads and to banks and other businesses and loans in the hopes that they would then hire more workers who would have jobs, who would then go out and spend more money driving demand. So basically what he's doing is he's putting the money in at the top of the economic pyramid. He's putting the money in to the businesses themselves and hopes that that money will filter down to the, to the consumers, to the people who are struggling um, to, to correct the economy. And he just keeps telling the American people, you know, prosperity is right around the corner, but yet they're, they're unemployed and they don't really have any, any hopes of getting that, um, that effort. So if we look at what we mean again by this trickle down effect, um, this is also, sometimes you'll hear it referred to as Keynesian economics. You'll learn a lot about this next year when you take econ. So where Hoover's putting the money in is up here at the top of the economic pyramid and hoping that these businesses and these banks will make more loans to start new companies, to hire more workers, and that those workers, those jobs that are going to be created will bring in more workers and those workers will have an income that can now be taxed, as we talked about with the 16th Amendment, 
and that it's going to continue to generate more cash and, and uh, stimulate the economy. Here's the problem. The Reconstruction Finance Corporation that is supposedly putting the money in here at the top doesn't have any requirements about how that money's going to be spent. So many of these companies that are watching other um, businesses within their same market sector go out of business, they're going to hang on to that money. They're not going to want to, to let it go and release it to hire more workers and increase those jobs. Those banks are not going to be wanting to give out those loans because they've seen all of these other banks go out of business. So if you've got an infusion of cash into your bank, you're going to want to hold on to it. So because there is very little um, procedure attached to the money that's coming in from the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, it doesn't work. Okay, one of the other attempts that Hoover does implement to try to correct this situation is a public works project. The Hoover Dam that's going to be constructed, um, not terribly far from Las Vegas, is going to put a lot of people to work. And it's also going to resolve a couple of other issues in the region. It's going to provide uh, power. And it's also going to, uh, like I said, put people to work. So it's, it's helping all of those situations at one time. This is going to be similar to the, the vast majority of the work projects that Franklin Roosevelt will, will put together in the New Deal. So it is a, a huge undertaking and it's often called the Hoover Dam, even though its original name was the Boulder Dam, but it's going to be again, one of those examples of Herbert Hoover's attempts to try to regulate the economy. But here's the thing, this is only in one small area. This is not going to be widespread attracting workers from across the country to come out to Nevada to work on the Hoover Dam. Um, so again, this has limited success only in this certain area where it would work. But if we look at the amount of money that Hoover puts into these projects, the Hoover Dam project and also the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, it's far more than you would see any other president do prior to him in terms of these, these domestic work projects. Now, if we're, so this is talking about federal money being spent in the billions of dollars. And we can look at this as a comparison. All right, so here we're coming down off of World War I. So that's gonna account for this high amount of spending here right in 1920. And we're beginning to scale back from that wartime production. So by the time we get to 1922, that's gonna be more in line with um, um, kind of the, the typical expenditures by the federal government. But then look what happens. So here, when we get to the stock market crash in 1929, and here's 31 uh, and 32. So this would be the Reconstruction Finance Corporation right here. So this is going to be more money than has ever been spent. Now, all of this that we see dramatically increase, this is all New Deal spending. Um, and as we get closer to the war effort, this is all New Deal money that's coming in to be spent. All right, so now let's think back. Um, in, in the 1890s, we talked about an event with Coxey's army that was marching on Washington, demanding that the government provide jobs for the unemployed through these work projects. So in the 1890s, that was not something that was, um, that was really a possibility. What we will find is that the New Deal is actually going to take that um, advice and, and the New Deal is going to be providing these jobs for unemployed workers where that was not an option here in the 1890s. All right, so Hoover's policies are very unpopular among the people who are struggling. You know, we talked about the unemployment rate was, was right around 25%. Even the 75% who had their own job, had still maintained their jobs, their wages were cut dramatically. So they were having a hard time feeding their families, paying their rents, and they even began to lose housing more and more. Um, and we had a, a big problem with homelessness. You can see the images here. These uh, little shacks are being built in public parks across the country because these are our public lands. When people lose their homes, can't pay their rent in their apartment, they've got nowhere else to live. So they take up residence and they build these little shacks in, in these parks and they become known as Hoovervilles, kind of in this derogatory term that's being referenced uh, are referencing how Hoover is to blame for their problems. So again, we've got these kids, Hoover's poor farm. Hard times are still hoovering over us. They're again, blaming the president for their issues. People would walk around with their pants pockets pulled inside out. Those were called Hoover flags. 
to represent the fact that they didn't have any money and that the president was to blame for their problems. Um, the farmers began to protest as well, as we mentioned before, the prices that their products were being sold for um, was less than what it was costing them to actually transport it to the market. So these farmers holidays would block um, movements of, of goods and in protest. And then you can also see, because they didn't want more, more product in the market that would, because um, they wanted to raise prices. So here you've got people just dumping out all of this milk rather than to send it to the market to try to, to raise the prices so that they can help themselves. Um, so things are really, really in bad shape. And then probably one of the, the more disturbing actions that Hoover took was with the bonus army. So we mentioned before Coxie's army was this group of, of unemployed workers in the 1890s who left Ohio in the Midwest and they came to Washington to, to ask the government to provide them with jobs. Well, in 1932, there was another similar type of protest, but this time it's veterans, war veterans from World War I. And there had been a bill that was passed um, called the Bonus Bill. And as you know, thanks for the, the veterans and their, their efforts in World War I, the government had promised to give them a bonus later on in 1946. And so by that point, if you were fighting in the war in the 19 teens and you were you know, somewhere between 18 and 30 years old, by the time you get to 1946, you're gonna be of retirement age. And so this was intended to be some, uh, a type of bonus that would support veterans in their old age. Well, the veterans who are now experiencing the Great Depression know that they've got this money to co coming to them in 1946, as promised by the bonus bill in the legislature, they want the money now. Now is when they are homeless and unemployed. So they don't wanna wait. So all of these veterans, they group together, they come to Washington and they want their bonus sooner. So look at all the places that they're coming from, New Mexico, North Carolina, Georgia, Washington, I mean, um, Wisconsin, you've got all of these different areas that are being represented in this March on Washington demanding that Hoover pay them their money. Um, here's, here's the thing, what Hoover does, instead of listening to the war veterans, he calls out the military under General Douglas MacArthur to go and force the veterans off of public lands. Well, MacArthur goes um, in pretty heavy hand handedly. He brings out tanks. Um, these veterans, they have built their own little shanty towns in the, in the public parks in Washington, DC. They set them on fire. Can you imagine how this is going to be presented in the news where you've got war veterans who are heroes of, the, of World War I being treated in this way by the President of the United States? This is a terrible, terrible situation for Herbert Hoover. 1932 is also an election year and he will go up against uh, Franklin Roosevelt who has, as we'll see in a minute, is the distant cousin of, um, um, Theodore Roosevelt. So Franklin Roosevelt is the cousin of Theodore Roosevelt. He's patterned his political career after his famous cousin who he idolizes. And it's a, a, a choice between Franklin Roosevelt and Herbert Hoover. So look at Hoover's campaign here. Don't swap horses, stand by Hoover. Talking about we're in a crisis, you don't want to switch your leadership now and go to something new. And what Roosevelt is promoting is a new deal for all Americans. So think about what his cousin Theodore Roosevelt had, had um, campaigned on. He campaigned on a square deal, which was a fair deal for everybody. Roosevelt is now saying, let's redeal the cards. Let's deal them out again and see what happens. Um, so look at the outcome. Here was Herbert Hoover's victory in 1928. We talked about the roaring 20s and all of the prosperity. And as a Republican, he's going to carry all of these states, but, but the Deep South, which we said the Deep South's not gonna vote for a Republican regardless of what happens. But in four short years, look at the switch here. So what can account for this is certainly the Great Depression and the problems that people are experiencing economically and the fact that they blame Herbert Hoover for their problems. So uh, Roosevelt wins in a, in a landslide victory um, and his inauguration will be in March of 1933. So the election's in November and it won't be until March until he comes in and Herbert Hoover refuses to allow 
Franklin Roosevelt to come in and begin to start making some of those changes. Um, we do see that that will be adjusted, um, that, that lame duck period that we've talked about before. That's adjusted with the 20th Amendment, and that happens during the, the, um, the administration of Franklin Roosevelt because of the problems of the Great Depression, and, and he was powerless to do anything about it with, with Hoover blocking him. All right, so let's look at Franklin Roosevelt's background um, here fairly quickly. So we talked about Theodore Roosevelt and his connection to Roswell. So here's Theodore Roosevelt Sr. marrying Martha Bullock of Bullock Hall in Roswell. And then these are their children. Um, you've got Elliot, Corinne, Anna, and Theodore. So these are, are the children of Theodore Roosevelt um, Sr., okay? And then we've got a whole different group of Roosevelts over here. So these are like, um, here's Theodore Roosevelt and here's Franklin Roosevelt. They are fifth cousins. So if you go back and, and their connection is that they share, so here's Theodore Roosevelt's father, grandfather, great grandfather, great great grandfather, great 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 grandfather, and four greats grandfather. My guess is you have no idea who your four greats grandfather is. And in that respect, typically you would probably not even know your, your fifth cousins. But if you have a fifth cousin who happens to be president of the United States, you probably know who he is. So they, they did know one another. Um, again, they were distantly related. And, and Franklin Roosevelt is younger. So look at the dates here, 1858, 1882. So he looked up to this cousin and, and he kind of patterns his career. He becomes assistant secretary of the Navy. He's going to be governor of New York. He's going to serve in the uh, legislature of New York. One area where they are dramatically different is that Theodore Roosevelt is a Republican. Franklin Roosevelt is a Democrat. But what did we say about Theodore Roosevelt's um, policies as related to the parties? That his policies were progressive and actually a little bit more like those of a Democrat. So they do kind of pattern their policies together as well as being very progressive. All right, now, Theodore or Franklin Roosevelt's wife is Eleanor Roosevelt. And Eleanor Roosevelt is the niece of Theodore. All right, so watch what happens here. So Theodore Roosevelt's um, brother, Elliot, is going to have a daughter who is Eleanor Roosevelt. So Eleanor Roosevelt, her uncle is Theodore Roosevelt. Now, again, do you know who your fifth cousins are? Or, you know, probably not. So this is um, very distantly related and Eleanor ends up marrying Franklin. Now, Elliot, uh, Eleanor's father, he died fairly early. And so at the wedding, uh, Theodore Roosevelt gave Eleanor away, walked her down the aisle, gave her away when, when, he, uh, when she married Franklin Roosevelt. So they go on to have these children uh, as well. All right, so that's kind of the background here of Theodore Roosevelt. Here's Eleanor Roosevelt. Her childhood was just not very happy. Again, like I said, her father died very early. Um, he had a problem with alcoholism. Her mother was just very, very harsh to her and never really, um, you know, didn't really support her in many ways. Uh, she was very self-conscious. She was, um, you know, she believed that she was unattractive and, and all of this and, and was just very unsure of herself. And then, you know, here's this, you know, handsome man, Franklin Roosevelt, who has all of this opportunity in front of him and they end up, they get married, they fall in love. Franklin Roosevelt was an only child and his mother is Sarah Delano uh, Roosevelt here. So here's Sarah, his mother. And she absolutely doted on Franklin Roosevelt. She, you know, just really was involved in every aspect of his life, almost too much uh, in many ways. And so she was always present in, in the, the family with Eleanor Roosevelt and Franklin Roosevelt. And they had Eleanor and Franklin Roosevelt, they did have trouble in their marriage. Um, he had an affair that Eleanor found out about. And she, you know, was planning to step aside and Sarah Delano Roosevelt was actually the one who stopped, stepped in and said, nope, we're not gonna have a divorce here because a divorce within this family would cost Franklin Roosevelt his political aspirations. He could never be president at that, at that time, um, they believed as a divorced man. 
So they remained married, but lived very, very separate lives uh, afterwards. Um, now she respected Franklin Roosevelt and his political career and actually helped him considerably once he contracted polio. So Franklin Roosevelt was paralyzed from his, his polio that he actually got as a young man. Um, he was in his, his late 20s early 30s, somewhere around in there when he contracted polio, which was unusual because usually polio struck children. Um, he, you know, was, was very, very active and athletic. And um, then one day he, he woke up and, and he was unable to, to move his legs. And it went from there. So he knew that with this handicap, this lingering handicap of the paralysis, in his legs from the waist down that he would not be again able to continue his political career unless he was able to overcome this in some way. So he worked for years to try to come up with a way of, of, of you know, seemingly being able to walk, um, to stand up, and to project this image of strength. And you can see, notice how his pant legs are just really, really long there they would tailor his pants specifically that way so that they would hang down and cover up these braces that he wore around his legs. So these were really, really heavy, strong braces. They were painted black to blend in with his shoes so they wouldn't shine. And he could lock them at the knees. And he, he learned how to balance, right? So he had these braces that he would balance. Um, he would often use, here's one of his sons, here's a, a son. And he would often kind of balance, you know, on there and, and keep hold of their arm. When he would give campaign speeches, they would get him there ahead of time and they would prop him up in front of the podium. And so he's always, when you see him speaking, he's always kind of hanging onto the podium and leaning in. It's, it's kind of projecting this idea of confidence, but really he's balancing on that podium. Um, and he doesn't really ever let go with both hands. Um, you never saw him pictured in public with crutches in a wheelchair and it was staged all right and then at this time the media went along with it I mean everyone knew that he had polio but think about the image that it creates that he's able to overcome this and the the media never published these photographs of him um, in in his wheelchair this is really one of the only the few, only one that I know of image of him actually in a wheelchair with his, his dog. He loved his dog, Fala. Uh, and there he was at home in the little White House here in Georgia in Warm Springs that we'll talk about. So the, the way that he kind of created this walk, uh, like I said, he learned how to balance on these, these braces, but then he also learned how to kind of create this movement where he would sling all of his upper body weight to one side and it would kind of force his leg to go in one direction and then he would sling all of his weight in the other direction and he learned how to balance it took years for him to be able to do this and so when they would give um he would give public speeches or whatever and it was not possible for him to be there ahead of time or, or set it up that way what they would do is that they would they would put the crowd they would put ropes that were very close together so it was kind of like this narrow walkway and what Roosevelt would do is he would do this kind of walking thing that he was he had able had been able to, to perfect. And he would sling his weight over to one side and he'd say, Oh, glad to see you, shake hands with someone and you know, kind of have a little, a little short chat with him. And then he would go the other direction. And, and it was a way for him to kind of avoid the awkwardness of how slow this process was. And it just created this illusion of a man who was able to overcome polio. So again, think about the context of the Great Depression. We've got World War II that's going to break out later on. Who do you want leading your country through this type of crisis, right? It's almost like he is, he's a superhero. He's got all of this strength and this power to be able to overcome these difficulties. So again, here we see him um, holding onto that podium, which is again, um, it's all staged. All right, and then there he is standing, looks totally normal, but again, it's because he's, he's propped in with these braces that are locked in place. All right, he also enjoyed time in Warm Springs in Georgia. So the Warm Springs is kind of near Callaway Gardens in the Western part of our state, close to the Alabama line. 
And the warm springs were thought to be therapeutic and treatment for polio patients. And Roosevelt visited there and instantly just felt comfortable and could relax. This was really the only place where he let his guard down. You can see how, um, how, how damaged his legs were from, from the polio. Um, and so here he is, he actually bought the, the Warm Springs Institute and, and really funded it and then built a home there. And he spent a lot of time at Warm Springs at what, what's known as the Little White House, which was his home there. Here again, you can see this photo that was never released to the public because they've got to get him out of the car. They've got to you know, prop him up. Um, and so that was not presented in, in the media, in the news media. Can you imagine today if a president was trying to, to hide or disguise some sort of, of condition like this? Certainly they would you know, relish in, in, the, in the story and, and expose it. So I think it's kind of interesting that the media was involved in continuing to, to manage the illusion that Roosevelt and his, um, his staff created. So when you go and visit the Little White House today, they have a fabulous museum that you, you can go into the house, but then they've also got a, a really, really good museum there at Warm Springs. So here they had a car. Um, he had his own car that was a convertible and it was retrofitted because remember he can't feel his legs. So he drove his car with his hands. And so this, this um, the pedals, the brake and the gas pedal, he used and, and adjusted it with this hand um, lever. And so they've got the car on display there that you can see. And he would drive all around in his car and have the top down and he'd just lean, out, leave, lean over the, the door of the car and talk to people and, and get to know what their, um, their concerns were and things that he could help with. All right, so now he is president and we've got the new deal that is going to um, be implemented. And so in his inaugural address, um, Franklin Roosevelt's first inaugural, the main line that you need to remember out of that first inauguration speech is the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. What fear might he be trying to address? Okay, think back to the, the economic crisis. Wasn't part of what was fueling the crash of the stock market people's fear that the prices were going to go lower? Isn't part of the problem on the runs of the bank the fear that the banks are going to go out of business? So what he's trying to say is that the biggest problem we have is panic. And that if people can cannot get caught up in these fears and allow the, the government actions that he's planning to put in place to be implemented, then it's all gonna be okay. Right, the biggest thing that we have to fear is more panic, is what he's talking about. All right, so here, look at the um, the image in New Yorker magazine portraying Herbert Hoover being very, very angry uh, about Franklin Roosevelt coming in to office, and they couldn't be more different. In addition to Roosevelt coming in as the Democratic president, there had also been a majority Democratic Congress elected. So the House and the Senate, Senate both have a majority of Democratic representation. So that means that Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal is going to have a very, very strong chance of getting passed in the Congress with like-minded Democrats. So notice here that we've got Roosevelt with the New Deal. Um, we're gonna start over again. We've got this federal reorganization and um, Congress is turning it over to him. And what he does, um, he will implement within his first 100 days this massive program of New Deal reform. I put these pictures in here to show you the toll that this job takes on Franklin Roosevelt. Now he's gonna be our only president to have been elected more than twice. And at this time, it was not a constitutional amendment restricting you to only two terms. He was able to run as many times as he wanted. So he was elected first in 1932. He ages quite a bit by 1936, but look at the difference between 1936 and 1940. Um, there, you know, he is really, really aging here. And then his decline, now that we're involved in World War II, look at, look at um, his situation there in 1945. He ends up dying in office not too long after he takes his fourth oath of office. Uh, and then Truman becomes president. So he surrounds himself with, with people who he can trust, who he believes are the most brilliant minds in America to deal with each of the areas in the executive branch that will have offices that need to be filled. 
So he's going to bring in, um, not politicians, he's gonna bring in, in professors, people who are academic in certain areas like economists and, and other people to give him advice. He's also going to have Republicans on board in his administration because again, he felt that they were the best people for the job. Secretary of Agriculture is gonna be a really key job here in the Roosevelt administration trying to get the farmers back uh, on, on firm footing. He also includes a woman in his advisory or in his cabinet. Frances Perkins will be the first Secretary of Labor. So that's kind of progressive as well that he's including women in these leadership or at least one woman uh, in these leadership roles in his administration. So the first new deal. Now I'm gonna have you in class. You're gonna be creating your chart and I've got a new deal chart because you have all these agencies, they kind of run together and you wanna be thinking about who they were supposed to help, what the policies were that were implemented, and did they work or not, and, and do they still exist? So that's what you're looking at on your New Deal chart. Um, and the first New Deal is going to be primarily in that first 100 days, during the first year or so of Roosevelt's administration. And the, the goal here of these first New Deal programs is immediate relief where we saw um, Herbert Hoover try the Reconstruction Finance Corporation by putting in money at the top with the banks and the businesses. Roosevelt's going directly to the base. He's going to the American people who are struggling, the homeless, the unemployed, um, and, and, and everyone who is, is in, in trouble financially. He also needs to, to try to calm the American people down. And he has what are known as fireside chats. And we know that in the 1920s, one of the main um, sources of entertainment, new technology was the radio. And over 90% of the homes in America had a radio by the 1930s. And he uses that media, that new form of media to his advantage with these fireside chats where he can talk directly to the American people. And he goes on, you know, usually on a weekend night and the family would gather around the radio and they would listen to what the president has to say. So that's why they were called fireside chats. And he explains many of his policies and, and what his goals are and what the purpose is for some of the actions that the government is taking. So in this first new deal, you can see the four main areas that he is looking to, to resolve. Bank failures, first and foremost, we've got to get the economic system um, on stable footing. We've got to help the farmers. And then we've also got to deal with the unemployment issues. All right, so here's one of the, the first areas of reform in that first new deal. So in the first 100 days, this is what he's going to be doing. The emergency banking bill is going to shut down all of the banks in the United States for four days. And during that time, you're going to have the money shuffled around. So the, um, the Federal Reserve we know is responsible for printing the money and determining how all of that's going to be um, adjusted. And so what he's going to do is redistribute the cash so that the banks are solvent, meaning that they have enough money to be able to sustain any more bank runs and, and restore the public's confidence in, in the banks. So this was a temporary measure, right? It was only for four days. And it was about getting control of the banks and redistributing the money to save banks from going out of business. The other part of it, okay, he's going to explain this in his very first fireside chat. And we're gonna to listen to a portion of that in class where he's talking directly to the American people. And so again, notice what he's saying. I wanna to talk to you for a few minutes with the, um, the people of the United States about banking. And he's going to talk about it in a way that people understand. He's not gonna talk about it in, in terms that an economist would use. He's talking about deposits and he talks about, you know, you've got to, to trust what's happening here and we're shutting down the banks for four days and here's why we're doing it. So he gives a very clear explanation to the American people so that they're not fearful. Can you imagine if suddenly the government comes, comes in and says, we're gonna shut down the banks for four days? I mean, there would be people just completely out of control panicked. He's telling them what's going to happen, okay? In addition, he's also going to pass the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, the FDIC. That's going to be part of the emergency banking bill that's going to be created. 
So FDIC is basically insurance on your bank account. So remember we saw those long lines of people down the street trying to get all of their money out of the bank before it ran out. And if you were in the back of the line and the bank ran out of money, then your entire life savings was gone. There was no recourse that you had. You couldn't sue the bank and get your cash back. So FDIC insurance is going to ensure that your bank account is guaranteed by the federal government. So if your bank goes out of business, if your bank fails, you don't need to worry about your life savings. The federal government guarantees that your, the amount of cash that you had in that bank is going to be delivered to you by the federal government. Okay, so this is the, the Glass-Steagall Act that is going to be creating the FDIC insurance. Today, every bank has FDIC insurance, or at least any bank that you should be putting your money in. But there are limits that it would cover. So it would insure a bank account up to $5,000, which in the 1930s was a lot of money. So if you had more than $5,000, then you needed to put your money in multiple different banks. Look what that does. That forces the wealthy to put money in a bunch of different banks, which means that they all have cash to be able to operate. Today, we still have FDIC insurance. You see that sticker in the window at the bank and it guarantees your bank account up to $250,000 per person per account. So that means, um, you know, if I have more than $250,000, but my husband and I have a joint bank account, then that means that we are insured up to $500,000 in that bank account. If we have more money than that, then we're going to put money in multiple banks, again, to make sure that we don't go over that FDIC insurance limit. Absolutely successful. And yes, it still exists because think about what that does. That immediately removes the panic that people would be standing in line trying to take their money out of a bank so that they wouldn't lose it all if it were to fail. So the Glass-Steagall Act creates the FDIC Insurance Corporation. Okay, other thing, here's where we get off of the gold standard. So Franklin Roosevelt will lift the gold standard and we go into um, not necessarily true free silver, but we get more into fiat money where we've got um, um, paper money that's going to, to be valued more based on the recommendations of the Federal Reserve. So bottom line, we have more money in circulation. What does that do to prices? Well, it's going to raise those prices, which is what the farmers need to get them back on their feet. So this is also very, very important for, um, for the economy. Agricultural Adjustment Act, this is also going to be in, in um, reference to trying to help out farmers. And it's going to help with raising crop prices as we've talked about. And it's also going to provide subsidies. One of the other problems to try to get enough money, a lot of farmers started planting more and more acreage of their farms. Well, the more they're producing, they're driving wages down. So the Agricultural Adjustment Act is going to provide subsidies, which is money to the farmers to not grow crops or to not slaughter or to not uh, raise as many cattle because that's just driving down the price for everybody. Um, so this is, is going to be successful at that time um, in helping the, the crop prices, but it does not still exist. And it was declared unconstitutional in 1936. It comes back in a different form we do still have government subsidies today to help regulate crop prices to make sure that there's not overproduction of certain crops. Okay, another one that's going to end up being declared unconstitutional is the National Industrial Recovery Act. So this is going to be looking at business leaders. Part of this was trying to establish a minimum wage saying that companies would have to pay their, or factories would have to pay workers a certain amount of money. We have minimum wage today, right? Um, and it was also going to make sure that these, um, this agency, the National Recovery Administration, was putting together business, labor, and government all in one group to try to, to sort this out and to regulate prices and to establish minimum wages that are, are, are sold, are um, provided to workers. Now, notice what this woman's doing in this restaurant. She's putting up this banner, and it's this blue eagle, and it says, NRA, we do our part. So businesses that agree to support the National Recovery Administration and this idea of paying minimum wage to workers and, 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 and helping out the economy, 
they were advertising that because if you've got a choice, you know, let's say that you've, you know, you've got a little bit of money, you're going to take the family out to dinner, you might choose a restaurant that's helping in the overall crisis. So it's kind of showing that you're supporting the effort, uh, the New Deal effort. This was eventually declared unconstitutional. Now think about why this idea of minimum wage might have been declared unconstitutional. Wouldn't this be the government dictating to a, a privately owned business how to run their business and how much to pay their workers? So that was declared unconstitutional. Um, think about this whole chunk of Republican presidents that we've had in the past. They're the ones who have been appointing most of the Supreme Court judges. So they're very fiscally conservative. They're very Republican leaning. And this type of policy is not something that they would agree with. So their approach, their point of view would be important for why they would have declared this unconstitutional. Now, eventually it's gonna come back. Um, we'll see minimum wage coming back, but initially this, um, the National Industrial Recovery Act is declared unconstitutional. So here's that blue eagle that I was talking about. So it was a symbol of companies that were supportive of this effort. Okay, another one, Federal Emergency Relief Act. You're going to give money to those local agencies. Remember we talked about Hoover believed in localism and rugged individualism. If the state and local governments didn't have any cash, they couldn't distribute it and help uh, in their communities. And so this is giving those state and local districts money to then go and, and provide assistance, either through soup kitchens or homeless shelters or whatever it may be, it would be funded by the federal government and, and sent to these local agencies that can best help those who are unemployed. Yes, it was successful. No, it doesn't still exist because it was a temporary measure. The P Okay, now we're going to get into a group of, of programs that are all about putting people to work. So these are these government programs, sort of like the Hoover Dam was but they're gonna be widespread across the United States. So the PWA or the Public Works Administration, again, helping the unemployed, they're going to be building big projects like there's the Golden Gate Bridge was funded partially by PWA uh, money and labor. Millions of people got jobs as a result of the PWA. Yes, it was successful, program doesn't exist, but certainly the buildings and the bridges do. Um, you know, they've, they've started kind of replacing some of the bridges here in the United States recently, uh, I'd say in the past 10 years or so, but when you look on the side of a bridge, usually there's like this concrete base that the railing comes out of, and they've usually got a date on it that kind of, um, you know, commemorates when that bridge was constructed. And I know the one that crosses over the Chattahoochee River, if you're coming from downtown Roswell down the hill and you go over into uh, you cross over the river, that bridge used to have, um, you know, cut into the, the concrete and it had the date like 1934, 1935, somewhere in there because it was a PWA project. All right, the CWA is kind of the same thing, but it's, but it's going to be more local types of projects. Here you can see these, uh, these workers who are, are building a, a new field, you know, playground or football field for this particular high school. So the CWA was more local projects, but again, it's just putting people to work. Same thing with the Civilian Conservation Corps. This is going to be young men, young single men who leave home and they go out into remote areas and they're going to be working out in the wilderness. So here you're going to see the um, um, trails that are going to be built, the forests that are going to be planted, you know, kind of revitalizing these um, areas that have been clear cut for some of the um, the industrialization that occurred. So they're trying to, to rebuild those natural resources in many ways um, and to use the resources responsibly. And so again, one of the other features here is that this one does include more minor, minority participation than many of the other programs. And again, it's temporary, okay? Um, we've also got to deal with the problems of homelessness and the Homeowners Loan Corporation. This is to try to keep people who still have their home try to keep them in their home and not to, to lose more, uh, have more people who are homeless. So what you do, if you've got a, a home and you know your mortgage payment, you're having a hard time meeting it, the homeowner's loan corporation is gonna come in and they're going to, the homeowner's loan corporation is going to come in and they're going to adjust your mortgage rate so that your payments are lower. And this helps people to stay in their homes and not become homeless. 
Then the other part of this um, is the Federal Housing Authority, FHA, which does still exist today. This is going to try to get people into a home. And it does two things. One, it's going to provide low interest loans for you to go out and build a new house. Well, if you're gonna go out and build a new house, then that's gonna put construction workers back to work. So it's, it's solving two problems at one time. FHA, Federal Housing Authority does still exist today. They do still have FHA loans. And it's probably one of the best loans that you can get. You know, usually um, when you, the first time you buy a house, you're probably gonna get, be able to qualify for an FHA loan. Um, because they're going to have the best interest rates. So this does still exist today. The TVA, Tennessee Valley Authority, again, putting people to work, but this is a regional project that's going to generate power. The Appalachian region in the Southern Appalachian region is a very poor rural area that did not have um, a lot of, of electricity, didn't have a lot of infrastructure there. And they're going to, to take the Tennessee River, they're going to build a series of dams along the Tennessee River that will allow power to be generated and to electrify this whole area. Uh, and the TVA, in, up until, I mean, it may still be the largest employer in Tennessee still, but it was a massive, massive undertaking and still does provide electricity for the region. All right, here's some questions about this one. Um, this utility agency, can the government control that utility? Um, and so that's going to be another question. Okay, so here, all of this area here, is uh, has power that is generated by TVA efforts. So this is where it exists today. So we've got all of these dams that are constructed along the Tennessee River um, that generate power for a wide, wide area of people in these rural areas. All right, so let's look at this political cartoon. You've got um, Franklin Roosevelt there. We know that because he's carrying his hat. He's got his initials. And he's got Congress over there that is the, the nurse and, and Franklin Roosevelt's the doctor and it says New Deal Remedies. So who's the old guy sitting in the chair? Well, if we look down here at his slippers, it says US and he's got stars on his legs. So that must be Uncle Sam. And he looks kind of sick. And so look what Roosevelt's saying. Of course, we may have to change remedies if we don't get results. So all of this medicine on the table, we've got all of these agencies and all of these new policies in the first new deal that have been tried. And so what Roosevelt's telling the, the Congress is, you know, we've put all of this in place in a hundred days. So all of these programs, all of these people going back to work, I mean, it was within three months time of him taking office. If it doesn't work, Roosevelt's telling the Congress, we're gonna come back and we're gonna try it again and come up with a different solution. Okay, also in 1933, prohibition is going to go away. Now, we talked about the ban on alcohol in um, the 1920s, early 1920s, and that comes on the heels of World War I. We're going to do away with that in 1933, but the 18th Amendment, you can't just say ignore it. You have to have another amendment that cancels the previous one out. So the 21st Amendment brings alcohol um, back legally to the United States where the 18th Amendment banned it. So this is um, important. I think you can consider why now um, you can tax alcohol. So this is going to kind of curb all of that organized crime and rechannel that legal production of alcohol into something that allows people to make money. All right, um, another thing that we've got to shore up is the stock market. And so the Securities and Exchange Commission was also created. And this is going to try to regulate the stock market and how stocks are bought and sold. We do still have the Securities and Exchange Commission. They have very, very strict rules about buying stock on the margin, about full disclosure of companies and, and where they stand with stockholders. And so all of that is regulated and monitored by the SEC or the Securities and Exchange Commission. Not everybody thinks this is a great idea because look at how much money this is costing. So Roosevelt is just generating all of this cash because we're no longer on the gold standard. And look at our deficit spending. Deficit spending meaning that we are spending more in federal programs than we are bringing in in tax revenue. So in 1932, when Roosevelt comes into office, our definite deficit spending was 461 million. In four years time, look at how dramatically that has increased. That's all of those New Deal programs. The American Liberty League and the National Association of Manufacturers are worried. 
Why would these manufacturers be worried? Well, part of the New Deal is putting regulations on them that they don't like. The American Liberty League is worried about the involvement of the federal government in in businesses and in society. So, so look at their symbol here, the Liberty Bell. So they're they're trying to look back at this idea of um, you know capitalism and limited government involvement and free enterprise. And they're saying that this program, this New Deal program, is going too far and is leaning more towards socialism. Remember that first. Um, um, diagram that we looked at at the beginning of this chapter where we're getting farther and farther away from limited government approach. Okay, there is another challenge here to the, to the programs. This is where the National Industrial Recovery Administration and the um, Agricultural Adjustment Act are going to be declared illegal is with the court case Schechter versus the United States. And so we've got these, these areas where the government is dictating to businesses how they are, how much they produce, what they charge, and how they pay their workers. And so that was declared unconstitutional through Schechter versus the United States. So this is where they're starting to strike down some of those policies. You've also got some challenges here um, from other people. So that's one extreme saying that the New Deal is, is leaning too far towards socialism. And then you have others who are saying it doesn't go far enough. You have these two men in particular, Francis Townsend and Huey Long, who are saying that the New Deal should go further in terms of the government helping uh, individuals. So Huey Long is from Louisiana and he has very, very strong control there uh, of, the, of the government and, and politics in his state. And he believes that you should, he, he calls it share our wealth. It's almost like he views himself as Robin Hood where he takes from the rich and redistributes to the poor. And there are a whole lot more poor people than there are rich and so they are voting for him. So he is, he's launching a lot of opposition to Franklin Roosevelt saying it's not going far enough. And then you've also got Francis Townsend, who is a doctor from California, who's saying that in all of these New Deal programs, there's a huge part of the American demographic that's being ignored. And that's the elderly. Elderly people can't go out and work on building the um, Golden Gate Bridge. They can't go and work in the CCC out in the, in the wilderness. None of these programs are helping elderly people who've lost their life savings in the bank collapses. And then you've also got Father Charles Coughlin, who is a Catholic priest who's also challenging the New Deal as well, that not enough people are being helped. So Roosevelt has a little bit of opposition here um, as he moves into his second term with the second New Deal um, coming in. And so the second New Deal, now that we've kind of, kind of stopped the decline, now we've got, we've got it stabilized. Now we've got to recover and come up with some long-term solutions that will be lasting. So he's going to redefine this idea of uh, government involvement. So look at these um, outcomes here. So the second New Deal, right? The, the first New Deal would be in that first 100 days. And then everything that comes afterwards would be about long-term recovery and reform. So notice the, his margin of victory here. So in 1932, we saw, you know, coming after Hoover, overwhelming victory here in 1932. By 1936, it's even a, a larger victory than it was before. Look at that electoral vote. So that means that people are mostly satisfied with those New Deal programs to start with, okay? Um, then we get to 1940, there's gonna be a little bit more opposition coming in in 1940, and then a little bit more in 1944. So these, these arguments, right, that um, Townsend and, and Huey Long are, are projecting are having a little bit of an effect, okay? So here's where people who are part of the American Liberty League and the um, Manufacturers Association are, are getting concerned and people who are worried about this leaning towards a more liberal approach. If we look at this part of, of this um, graph, if we look at this axis, we're talking about social involvement, the, the government's regulation of, of, of social issues, okay? And then this axis is taking, looking at the government's regulation of economic issues. So we can see that people over here would be conservative in the fact that they want more government um, regulation of, or they want more government regulation of 
of or use the government for some regulation of social behaviors that could be dealing with um, race or, or dealing with you know some sort of, of of policies, okay? But they want limited economic involvement by the government, okay? These people who are libertarians, they want more government regulation on social issues and are, I'm sorry, less government regulation of social issues and less government regulation of the economy. So they are, I'm sorry, let me try this again. So over here, they want limited government intervention in the economy, but they want more government intervention on social behaviors, okay? People in this quadrant want less, want more government intervention on social behaviors and more government intervention on regulating businesses. So you've got different quadrants here. When we get more into this area, which the New Deal begins to approach this, this call or this section, this is what we call a welfare state where the state or the state here meaning government is responsible for the welfare of its citizens, okay? Not the rugged individual, rugged individualism that we saw with Hoover. So the government would be responsible for people's own livelihood and their, their own stability, okay? We've got uh, new programs that come in in the second New Deal. And this is going to be the National Labor Relations Board. We're going to once again, see the government side with labor. So the Wagner Act is going to support um, workers and give them more protection to use collective bargaining and to negotiate. Um, and if there are instances where, where workers are, are disputing what their employers are, are doing, then you can take those complaints to the National Labor Relations Board. So the Wagner Act creates, creates the National Labor Relations Board and supports uh, in industrial workers and labor unions. Father, um, I mean, um, Francis Townsend's ideas about helping the el elderly, they do become reality in the Second New Deal. So Roosevelt, I believe, listened to those arguments and the Social Security Act is passed. And so this is going to provide um, a pension for retired individuals. So this is kind of what we're talking about with those social programs where the government is responsible for the livelihood of individuals. And it also is going to provide insurance. So social security provides insurance for for people who are disabled in some way or are the subject of some sort of work-related accident where they can't support themselves. So this does still exist today. WPA, more unemployment programs where we're going to be building various um, projects around the country. If you've ever been to San Antonio, this is the Riverwalk in San Antonio. If you've ever been to the North Georgia mountains, the Appalachian Trail begins there. The Appalachian Trail, you can start in Georgia and you can walk on one pathway and find yourself in Maine uh, a number of months later. And so that pathway, that Appalachian Trail is constructed with WPA labor and money. Um, now, do we have to have these, these projects? Are they necessary? No, but they're nice and they help put people to work. So these projects do still e exist. Look at the money that was spent. $11 billion was spent on these programs. 1936, Roosevelt is reelected. Notice his campaign slogan, carry on with Rose Roosevelt. And so um, his opposition, it, the Republican, look what they're going to be campaigning on, deeds, not deficits. So they're referencing this idea of all of the, the spending that is coming out of the federal government, which that in and of itself, they're saying could become dangerous as well, that this is not sustainable long-term. All right, now we said before that the Supreme Court struck down a couple of the New Deal programs. So once Roosevelt is safely reelected, he proposes what we call the court packing plan. And Roosevelt's looking at those Supreme Court judges and he says, you know, a lot of them are, are older men. So what he is proposing to do is to increase the number of judges by adding six more judges to the Supreme Court. And that would be for anyone who is over 70 years old. So that's what Roosevelt's saying. We're going to go from nine to 15. We're going to add six more judges. Well, guess who gets to appoint Supreme Court judges? That would be the president. So Roosevelt would get to choose them. So what kind of judges would he, would he choose to fill those new six positions? Well, he's going to, to choose people who support the New Deal. 
So this is, um, he's going to get backlash, certainly from his Republican counterparts. And even some of the Democrats believe that he may have kind of overstepped things here by proposing to add more judges to the Supreme Court. So we've got, uh, notice what it's saying here, Franklin Roosevelt, he's climbing these steps, government reorganization, we've seen that with the New Deal. And then his next step here is Supreme Court revision by adding the judges. And look, he's headed towards the seat as a dictator. And that's something that people were quite worried about. So in this court cartoon, notice what it says, the qualifying test. So he's interviewing all of these judges and they're all saying, yes, 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 yes. But notice what's here in the trash can, the constitution and the scales of justice. And so they're saying that this is an abuse of power by Roosevelt. So Pete, he has to back off of it, all right? He doesn't actually implement this, but the court packing plan is one area that Roosevelt gets criticism for what he is proposing while he's president of the United States. So he backs off and it doesn't become reality. We still have nine judges as the number on the Supreme Court. He ends up getting to appoint some anyway, because some of them um, pass away. I mean, he's president, he's elected four different times. So during that time period, that extended time period, he does get to appoint some new judges. And of course, they're going to be liberal leaning judges. So if we look at these, um, these, these new judges that come in um, and, and judicial philosophy, we're going to see that they are mostly judicial activists um, that believe that policymaking is okay, that you're, you're making your decisions based on the constitution, but also what you believe is also appropriate at that time, that it is that the constitution has to change with the time. So this is kind of where these new judges that come onto the court are, are going to be, where the Republican leaning judges would have been over here. Now we've already studied early on in the, in the year, strict versus loose construction. So we're kind of moving away from this side of strict construction and moving more towards judicial activism at the time. All right, so that's kind of where these new judges will lean. Other policies that come in under the second new deal, Fair Labor Standards Act, look what comes back. Here is the minimum wage. And so this is also going to outlaw child labor. We do still have this today. Parts of it are um, still in existence, which is the minimum wage. Um, and it was somewhat controversial because, again, people are worried about this um, telling a, a private company, the government telling them, requiring them to hire certain or, or to pay certain amounts of money to limit the number of hours that you can work in a week because people are saying, well, what if I want to work more hours in a week? What if I, I you know, what if I'm a child and I want to work, right? So these policies are going to be set up by the Fair Labor Standards Act. So if we're looking at the New Deal um, and we're comparing it to Hoover's plan, um, you know, we, we talk about how are they going to address the economy? And so this, this government infusion of economic regulation is going to be called priming the pump. So if we're trying to pump more money, we're trying to stimulate the economy, where's that going to happen? So if we've got the economic pyramid here, right? The wealth versus the population, in Hoover's administration under trickle down economics and the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, the government infuses the money here for it to be invested in businesses to hire more workers to then eventually stimulate the economy. Roosevelt's approach to priming the pump, the New Deal, is going to come in at the base. All of these programs that are hiring workers, that are setting minimum wages, all of that is putting in, in direct relief to the people at the base. So there's a very different economic philosophy at work here. All right, so um, Roosevelt, we can see here again that unemployment, here it was at its peak when he came into office. It declines with that first new deal and those hiring projects. We've got a slight recession that comes into place here during the, the second new deal. We call that the Roosevelt recession where unemployment spikes a little bit. We're not producing as much as we once did. And so the, the, the um, inflation is part of the problem. But then look what happens. We see that unemployment plummets here uh, in the early 1940s. What accounts for that? Is it all New Deal? Actually, no. What accounts for this is going to be World War II. So once World War II happens, this is gonna be the attack at Pearl Harbor. So when that attack at Pearl Harbor occurs, um, and also we could go back to 1938, 1939, 
even though we were not yet in the war, we were supplying all of these um, weapons, <clears throat> excuse me, weapons through the cash and carry policy and some of the others to our to allies, Great Britain and, and France in World War II, even before the United States got involved. So that's going to be putting people to, to work as well. So this Roosevelt recession, where we saw it starting to go up a little bit again, it's the war effort that is going to bring this down dramatically to look almost everyone who wants a job in the US is gonna have a job. Um, and that's the end of World War II. And so here by 1945, World War II is over. And then we see unemployment come back to a more normal predictable rate at that point. All right, so we've got again, federal bureaucracy. So if we look at these areas where the government is involving the number of federal employees, people who are employed by the government, it almost didn't exist here in the early years of the, of the nation. We see a few starting to be hired here as we expand the executive branch a little bit. And then certainly when we get to the New Deal, this is all Roosevelt's New Deal. All of these people employed um, by the federal government. We see another spike again when we see the Great Society programs and then it kind of stabilizes here in a, a more modern, modern, modern level of government jobs. Not everybody's going to experience the benefits of the New Deal. So let's look at some of these groups that are um, impacted in different ways by the, by the New Deal. They're not all going to get exactly what they want. Some will, um, some get some advantage, but it's, it's, it's not always going to be lasting. So organized labor, they are going to, to have an, a new organization, the Congress on Industrial Organizations or the CIO. Eventually it's going to merge with the AFL and they are going to be organizing their workers. And um, it's a different type of worker. These are more factory workers. And they start to become more politically active because they believe that the government can do more. So they begin to really pay attention to these elections and throw their supports to, um, to, to leaders in elections. Women in the New Deal, there are some jobs, but they don't always receive equal pay. Okay, we saw Eleanor Roosevelt when people were struggling. She travels the country. Her husband can't travel very well. So she goes around the country. She's meeting with the, the coal miners. She meets with, with people in the military. And then we've got Frances Perkins, Secretary of Labor. So, so there are some, um, some successes that come out of this, but again, there's not equal pay. It's not perfect, but there is some, some support. African-Americans, there is some support. Uh, Roosevelt's going to put together what he calls his black cabinet that are going to provide advice to New Deal agencies. We saw that the WPA was more inclusive in, in the labor, but not all of these agencies were. So there is also an effort we're going to see in the Federal Writers Project where they're going to preserve African American culture. We're coming on the heels of, of the Harlem Renaissance in the 1920s. So this is another effort by the federal government to preserve some of that culture um, with, um, with, with getting oral history, to get people to tell them what it was like prior to uh, the Civil War. And, and by the 1930s, many of those individuals who had, had grown up in slavery, they're, they're elderly and, and those stories needed to be recorded. And so that did happen. Okay, one individual who was part of, um, part of the, the Black Cabinet was Mary McLeod Bethune, and she is an educator, and she worked very closely with Eleanor Roosevelt. She ends up creating her own school, Bethune-Cookman University, still uh, a prominent university in Florida where she lived, and so she's really focused in, uh, focusing on young people, African-American um, students and, and children, and making sure that they have a good solid foundation for a good education, okay? However, there really was no um, advancement made on ending segregation. And so these are our policies that are not going to be beneficial to African-Americans. And then also sharecroppers with the Agricultural Adjustment Act, that's gonna hurt sharecroppers where you know, they're, they're just renting the land. If you think about the subsidies that are being given to farmers not to produce or not to grow certain crops, well, that goes to the landowner. It doesn't go to the, to the sharecropper who's just renting the or doing the labor on the land. So that kind of hurts them as well. 
Um, one area of the New Deal that, that tries to help Native Americans is the Indian Reorganization Act or the Indian New Deal. And they're going to create the Bureau of Indian Affairs and it's not perfect. So yes, there is a little more autonomy given to Indian tribes where they can control their religion a little bit more um, and control their lands more, but it's not perfect. So it's a step in the right direction, but again, not perfect, okay? Another feature that just adds to the struggle in uh, the 1930s is the Dust Bowl. So where we call the 1920s the Roaring Twenties, we're gonna call the 1930s the Dirty Thirties because things are bad in the 1930s with the economic crisis, but also because of the Dust Bowl. So this area right in here, centered in and around Kansas and Oklahoma, this is going to be an area where there is severe drought. You've got high winds and you have over um, cultivation of crops where the natural vegetation um, that holds the soil in place with their root structure is gone. So when you put all of that together, you have these massive wind storms that will kick up. Um, so these wind storms happen at the same time that the farmers are struggling here. So when we look at um, some of these images, this is what I'm talking about by a dust storm. These are massive storms, you couldn't predict it. Um, it would get into the, to the lungs of the, the cattle and the pigs and, and they would suffocate. Um, you couldn't keep it out of your house and you certainly couldn't grow anything on this land. Look at these, this is a farm. Is there any point to you even staying there if you're a farmer? Probably not because nothing's going to grow here anytime soon. So this is um, a very, very desolate scene. This kind of reminds me of the opening of The Wizard of Oz when they um, showed Dorothy on the farm in Kansas. And this was part of the, that whole area, the Dust Bowl, as we call it. So with these dust storms, a lot of the people out in the West, they can't grow anything. You've got the dust storms, they're desperate for work. So they pack up and they leave. Um, and they are looking for opportunity and where they end up heading is farther to the West. They're headed towards California. And these people who are headed to the West out of the Dust Bowl area are known as the Okies, the Okies from Oklahoma, but they're also from other states as well, but they were just referred to as Okies. And along the way, I mean, they can only get as far as a, a tank of gas would take them. They don't have any money, so they're gonna stop wherever their car stops and they're gonna stay there, try to do some odd jobs, get a little bit of money, put a little more gas in the car and keep on going. And everything they own is tied to that car. And they, they end up in these little communities. John Steinbeck wrote the classic novel, The Grapes of Wrath, which is depicting this, uh, this family that is um, down on their luck. They're, they're struggling economically and they are looking for opportunities. So it kind of highlights the situation that the Okies would face. So again, here you can see they've got all their stuff tied to their car. They've stopped here on the side of the road and they're probably gonna be there for a while. And so there's a baby just, just playing in the road um, because there's nothing else for them to do. When they showed up in California, you can imagine they're just adding to the competition for what few jobs there existed. And so they weren't always welcome. And um, you could spot them very easily because of, of how they had all of their possessions in their car. This particular image you need to be very familiar with. Um, it's called Migrant Mother. And it was a photograph taken by this woman who was working in one of the New Deal um, Art, art projects, which we'll see in just a few minutes. And her name was Dorothea Lang. And she was trying to document the plight of the Okies and, um, and their situation. And she came across this shanty town where all of these people were living um, and they were stuck there. And you can see she's got these three children, these two children here, and then the baby in her arms. And you can just see the desperation in her eyes. And so this became an iconic image that has kind of captured the emotion of the, the Great Depression and the desperation that people had at that time. So this is often used as a symbol of the Great Depression in the 1930s. So that would be a, an image to really remember and be able to associate it with this time period. Another area of the Second New Deal that's aimed at helping people in rural areas is the Electrification Administration. If you are stringing up electric uh, lines, power company lines, and you can string them up to a neighborhood that's going to connect 100 houses in, in one neighborhood, and they're all gonna be paying for that service, that is much more cost effective than going out into this rural you know, cattle ranch that is itself 100 or, or 200 acres 
and size and to connect one house. So many of the, um, the, the farming areas were not connected to the power grid because it didn't make any sense for the power company to, to build the power poles, string the lines and all of that for one house. So what this does, this agency does is provides money to the utility company to go and connect those farmhouses. And so look at the dramatic change from 1935 to 1950, we go to 90% of rural, rural farms having electricity connected to them. So it was definitely successful. Okay, then another group of unemployed workers are the artists, whether you were a writer, an actor, an actress, or a, a visual artist. So these people are all going to be put to work through these various programs that the federal government is going to pay for. So when they go and they, they record the, the stories, uh, we call them the slave narratives from the, um, 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 during the, when they're recording them during the Great Depression, that's part of the Federal Writers Project. They go and they interview these people, they record their stories. Um, you're going to have musicians that are going to give free concerts in communities that are paid for by the federal government. So again, it's putting those people to work, but it's also adding to the culture of the United States. So we still have their, um, their written works that we still have access to and, and have availability to, um, but the programs themselves don't still exist. So the Federal Writers Project, Federal Art Project, Federal Theater Project. These are some of the, the products. So each state um, was featured in its own American guide so you had the New, York's, the New York City Guide, you had a guide to Georgia where they would highlight all of the features of the state and places to visit and famous people. And, and it was basically kind of um, um, a publication that would encourage more people to, to learn about and to visit each of the states. So look what it's talking about, that these guides are going to, um, to be to illustrate our national way of life, yet at the same time portray variants in local patterns of living and regional development. And so this was, again, just putting people to work. Was it necessary? No, but it was nice to have that completed. Um, author that you're probably familiar with, and we've already talked about her in connection with the Harlem Renaissance was Zora Neale Hurston. She was employed by the Federal Writers Project and she worked in Florida at that time. And she put together um, her, her novel um, she was writing during the, the, the Federal Writers Project. All right, then the murals, the WPA, um, we're going to see that new post offices, right, where they're building new federal post offices with WPA money, they're going to hire the artists to come in and decorate them and paint these murals. And so you can again see this is one in Florida. And so they're highlighting uh, the area with the alligators and the swamps. Um, here's one that is, these are both from Georgia, where you've got the farmers that are portrayed here, and then College Park that's going to be kind of, you know, near Atlanta, where you've got all of the, the trains that are important there in the city. So then we need to think about, all right, so with all of this that's gone on with the New Deal, was it or was it not successful? So you could argue this multiple ways. You could argue, yes, it was successful because it does kind of stop the decline of the economy. You could also look at its limitations. You could look at the, the change from uh, to a more liberal approach to economics and, and the idea of the welfare state and whether or not that's appropriate. Um, so there are all kinds of arguments and you have plenty of evidence that you could use to support those claims. So again, I also want you to think about what does it do long-term in the United States, this tradition that is now established by the New Deal. So there we have it. There's the New Deal. There's a lot to it. It's a lot of agencies. I'm not terribly concerned that you memorize every detail of all of those agencies. I want you to think about large trends. What are we doing with these various agencies that deal with banking and deal with unemployed workers and deal with farmers in rural areas? I want you to be able to have examples of that, but I also want you to think about the bigger picture rather than just memorizing a bunch of you know, minute details related to these. Know what they did, know why they're important, know where they were criticized, um, and know examples. All right, so until then, until next time, keep reading and go make history.